folks. Seven o'clock. We have all board members present. We'll call the May Board of Supervisors meeting in session. And for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the, to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, let us pray. Lord, be with us tonight as we work through the county's issues, personality issues, and make Amelia the best place we can make it. Also, let's be with Mr. Bob Jones's family. He is a sitting supervisor for Prince Edward, which was passed away in a motor vehicle accident here recently. Let's keep them in our prayers. Amen. Yeah. Welcome everybody here tonight. That brings us to the approval of the agenda. Anybody have any amendments to the agenda? I have one. There is no public hearing on Mr. Langford's special uh, conditional rezoning. We've already had that. It would just be a vote tonight. Is there anything else? Yeah, I'd like to remove the uh, the budget. Okay. You want to remove the revision to the budget? Yes, sir. I think those are two amendments. All in favor of those amendments, raise your hand. Anybody anticipate a need for a closed session tonight? Moving on. Got the minutes been presented to you in your board book for the regular meeting and the continued meeting. Any additions, comments on those? Uh, Mr. Chairman, for the April 20th meeting, <clears throat> I'd like the minutes to be more clear about the two event permits um, to actually state that our vote was to not charge for the EMS services as well, rather than just say it's approved. Okay. Ms. Arthur, can you make that change? Mr. East, would you like to put a motion to accept them with that change? Yes, if no one else. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve both sets of minutes with that change. Motion on the floor. All in favor of approving the minutes with the change? Raise your hand. Who cares? Same thing with the financial reports. We've had those to go over. Any comments, <clears throat> concerns? Board's pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Motion on the floor to approve the financial report as a block. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries. All right. That brings us to the public comment time. Anybody wishing to speak on anything? You're welcome to speak. There is a public hearing on the solar facility later on. He certainly can speak at both, but if you can speak to the general comments in this section, that'd be great. Try to keep it to three minutes. Good evening. Laura Walsh, District 3 taxpayer, locally elected commissioner of the revenue. I have thought a lot about what I want to say, and honestly, there's a lot that I want to say. I want to hammer the facts at y'all, but it's clear you don't want to hear me. It seems that you also don't care about the majority of your constituents choosing me by election twice. So I would like to leave you and the citizens with this thought. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to the future of the commissioner's office? What's going to happen to my staff? 
what's going to happen to the revenue stream for this county and what's going to happen to the service to our citizens what's going to happen to all of that when y'all finally let the county administrator push me out of here thank you thank you Ms. Walsh good evening I am Susie Gunter a 66 year resident of Amelia County. Two years ago, the county administrator rode Animal Control Officer Kirsten Kruger's behind while the Board of Supervisors stood by on the sidelines and allowed it until she filed a grievance against the county administrator that he himself was allowed to handle. Of course, nothing came of it. She became discouraged, quit her job and moved out of the county. A big loss for Amelia County. The county administrator has now been on Commissioner of the Revenue, Laura Walsh, for going on seven years. And the Board of Supervisors is still on the sideline, allowing it to happen. No previous Commissioner of the Revenue that I can remember has brought in the same proportionate amount of revenue for Amelia's budget that Laura has. If you lose her, it will be another big loss for Amelia County. Put yourselves in my position for a moment. As a citizen, having my private information that I don't even share, shared to the public. As a parent, having pictures of my daughter's derriere shared to the public. Would any one of you want your daughter's derriere on display? As a grandparent, having my minor grandson's medical information shared to the public. What did any of this have to do with county business? Laura has put a lot of information out to the public, but none of it has been private information. I want each and every one of those distributed flash drives returned to Laura and Lee. And don't think that the whereabouts of most of them aren't known. The county administrator has become vindictive to the point of restlessness, recklessness. Because of his treatment of Kirsten Kruger two years ago, I asked that you give him his $132,000 severance and send him home. Because of his recent reckless actions, and his vindictive treatment of the Commissioner of the Revenue, I'm asking you once again that you terminate his employment with the County of Amelia. He has become a big liability to the County and to each of you as a Board of Supervisors members and his employers. I, as a private citizen of Amelia County, am not precluded from filing suit for his sharing my privately protected information, which will unfortunately include all of you as a governing body that will not rein him in and thereby continues to allow this behavior. Let's fix this now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Gunn. Uh, Grace Wyant, uh, District 3, 18601 Patrick Henry Highway. Mr. Jones, your words and actions toward Sean and I at the budget meeting were disrespectful and unwarranted. However, we forgive you because you don't know us or what we stand for. And, all, and also, most importantly, we forgive you because God calls us to be forgiving and to show grace and mercy to others just as he shows grace to us. Since you don't know who we are, let me clarify. I'm not Sean's kinfolk. I'm his wife of 20 years. I've worked for ACPS for 15 years. And as Sean stated, we've been actively involved in this community for our whole adult life. I work here because I serve the children of Amelia County, and I will not apologize for that. Furthermore, Sean campaigned on supporting the schools, and I appreciate him keeping good on those promises he made to the community. Also, with a little more research, 
you would have discovered we have four children, one niece, two nephews, and many children's friends that also attend the school. In addition to supporting the schools, Sean is a well-respected coach because he cares about the kids and the future of our county. Just because we are actively involved in the, in the community does not mean that Sean should not support the schools. Also, let me assure you, if Sean wanted to be rich, he would not have married a teacher. Teaching is not about money. However, I do need my salary to help support our family. Lastly, Sean and I are a team. I do not speak for him, but I will always speak in support of him. He is hardworking and intelligent, and he does not need my help to serve on this board. Sean views his position on this board as an extension of community service, and over the last two years, he has had a good working relationship with the citizens of the county. It is my hope that these personal attacks will cease and that the board can begin working together to make a difference for the amazing people of this community. Thank you, Ms. White. Lee Walsh, be a county taxpayer. Shouldn't have to stand up here in front of y'all and do this tonight. My wife's a grown woman, usually handle herself. Well, when I read this here immediate release statement, found a whole lot of false statements in that press release, and you signed your name to it, Phelps. County administrator and the former county finance director lied and twisted things around to have law investigated by the state police. Then, county administrator lied on how he got personal messages off to Facebook. We've asked you to look into him. Y'all have refused. We've asked you to return the flash drives. And as far as I know, only one has turned rel relinquished here. Yes. Then you decided to put it all in public in this press release that's got three completely lies in it. Complete lies. I got the evidence right here. Anybody wants to see it tonight, they're more than welcome to see it. I'll hand them copies. It took two simple emails to figure out that the county administrator deceived y'all. I've got copies of them too. Sheriff's office said they didn't have nothing to do with receiving any pictures. We can read it later. Mighty funny, the sheriff said they didn't obtain any of those messages and they haven't ever had any more than was given to them from the county administrator. That's a drop in the bucket to the 900 pages that Harvey distributed of my personal information, my son's personal information, and my wife's personal information, and my mother-in-law's personal information, and my neighbor's personal information that he and none of you have any right to have. It ain't got a thing to do with a state police report. Nothing. I want to answer in writing, who else has gotten a copy of this? And you know who got it. You know how they got it. I want it in writing. And I want a public apology in this paper to my wife because you're trying to destroy her name. And I want y'all to run his rear on out of this county like he's trying to do to my wife. Pick a side, whether it's right or wrong. Pick a side. Pick the right side. What's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. That's all I got to say. I've got evidence in writing from Bright. Oh, I got evidence in writing from Bright that ain't nothing changed. This IT security, Mr. Harvey has since instituted better security measures. Oh yeah, I totally forgot about that. Ain't nothing secure. Just keep, just keep believing what he's feeding you. You're just a pawn. Don't be a pawn. Make a decision. Thank you, Lee. Good evening. Diana Morris, 5740 West Creek Road, District 3. Um, I have resided in Amelia County for 35 years. 
My husband's family has been here over 200 years. Uh, 27 of the 35 years, I've been a real estate agent, broker, and a real estate company owner. Uh, I am an expert in the Amelia real estate market and have been hired by not only many of the citizens and property owners over the years, but also by companies who are seeking market values for properties here in Amelia County. As an active full-time real estate professional in Amelia County, my company has 12 real estate agents and three real estate brokers. I am very aware and knowledgeable of the factors that add and subtract from the value of real estate. I am vehemently opposed to the solar farm because my husband and I, along with our cherished neighbors, own a 40 acre adjoining parcel with their home to the solar farm property. I've worked with many buyers and sellers, and if given the choice between two properties to purchase, one with an adjoining solar farm or one not having an adjoining solar farm, a buyer is going to choose the one without adjoining solar farm every time. A buyer, this, you know, this devalues the property on its face value there, um, along with other factors. There are some, so many unknowns about a solar farm, too, as far as how it affects health, how it affects, uh, you know, what are they going to do in 40 years when these, these have to be disposed of? What does it do to the um, drainage of the properties? So all of the neighbors, you know, and all the adjoining properties are going to have to worry about this for many years to come. Um, really, the, in my eyes and many of the people that oppose it, the only value the solar farm is giving is lining the pockets of the owners who own, own the property where it's going. If you all approve this solar farm, then you will send a clear message that the greater good of the most citizens is not a concern for you, but lining the pockets of a few select is your priority. I appreciate you listening. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Paul Hill. I lived here over 20 years. I came to Amelia. I live in District 3. I've been here, like I say, over 20 years. I came from the city to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city. I live in Buckskin Creek Road. They want to put a solo farm across the street from where I came, where I live. I came here for the peace, the beautiful land, the woods, the beautiful deer, the beautiful landscape, the fields, the trees. Now they want to put a solar farm right across the street for where I live now. Like I said, uh, I don't want that out there. I don't want to come out first thing in the morning to see a, a solar farm out there. I don't want to see the last thing I see is a solar farm. I ask you not to approve the special exemption permit. As the lady in front of me, she's a realtor. She knows my value of my home. It's not going to be the way it is today. Again, I ask you, do not approve the special exempt permit. I thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Bobby Parsons, 5892 West Creek Road. Uh, looks like everybody's doing the solar now rather than later. We got we to gotta do it later on. This was really just for general yeah. comment. Whatever time you want to speak, Rob. It's got to be one or the other. Okay. I'll speak now and won't do it later. Uh, I got to echo a little bit of what Ms. Morris presented. My number one concern is the devaluation of the neighboring property. I've worked long and hard all my life to pay for my land and my house, and I can't just sit back and let something like this come in and devaluate my property. I don't think anybody, none of the audience, Y'all would stand by and let that happen if it was yours. Uh, I have done extensive research 
I have sent some of it to y'all. How much of it you got, I don't have a clue. <laughs> this book right here is a lot of research I've done. And a professor, North Carolina State University, been studying solar for over 30 years. He states in here that it will devaluate adjoining neighbor's property by 15 to 30%. He also, yes, he makes the good of it, but he also puts the bad in there. He's not the only one that I've gotten information from. Uh, Ottawa County, I have followed that very closely. Ottawa opened theirs up to, you know, a company wanting to do it over there. They have denied it. They, they a lawyer over there, I think I sent that to y'all too, that he did extensive research and came back and he had some information for Nottaway County that they were totally unaware of. Uh, it's, if we were to approve this, what is it going to do? It's going to open up a can of worms in Media County don't want to see. You ain't going to be able to put a lid on it. Uh, the, as far as I know, there has been no environmental study for the water runoff. That water runs into a creek right behind my house. It runs into uh, West Creek, which runs into Deep Creek, which runs into the Appomattox. Everybody knows where that goes. So has any kind of DEQ been, you know, report been submitted to y'all? None that I'm aware of. Uh, guys, this is not something Amelia County wants, not where it's at. You know, we've got rural, you know, land out there. We've got farmland. We've got highways that are already being torn all to pieces because of the logging going on in there. And VDOT comes down there and patch a pothole. They leave 15. They come back down there and patch one, they leave 20 more. And the traffic that's going to be in and out of there for these solar panels to construct everything, it's, it's going to be quite a bit. Uh, I know it's going to be some revenue for the county, but is it worth it? Because nobody knows in 30 years whether these things will be recyclable, whether anybody will even take them. Nobody's reached that point yet to know whether that's going to be acceptable to the recycling or whether it's not. Uh, no, I have not seen anything that shows an actual, any kind of chemical that runs off these panels in rainstorms. I don't think that's been presented to nobody on the board. Yeah, the solar company comes in here, they paint a beautiful picture. The car dealer going to do that to you, try to sell you a car. But, uh, they hadn't told you any of the negatives. I've done a several months now of research on this, and I've got quite a bit in here of the negatives. Talk to some of your other neighboring counties that have had trouble. Louisa, Goochland, Halifax, Greenville County had to shut half of one down not long ago, just several weeks ago, because of two fires in two weeks. Uh, have we got any kind of place in order do they does a solar company have any kind of uh, place in order for case of a fire hadn't heard of one it's uh it's not for this place i'm not against solar i'm against where they're trying to put it i mean i'm not going to sit back and let my land be devaluated and just say nothing you know is wrong with that i don't think any of y'all would, would go along with that either i don't think nobody it has worked all their life or something. Gonna turn around and let something like this come in here and take, you know, a good profit away from you. Thank you. Anybody else? Bobby Lights, 1600 Richmond Road. 
Yeah, I had to do it. I can't miss one. Um, I'm not for or against the solar panel itself, and I'm not for or against the farmer or the landowner as to what they want to do with their property. I think a landowner has the right to do with their property as they see fit it's beneficial to them. Just like farmers is growing corn, I don't think they should tell the farmer that's growing soybean how to grow their soybean. I think we have to come to an understanding along that way somewhere. Um, again, I moved into county 25 years ago, and the reason I moved into county was because of the rural area, just like some of the rest have said. I hate to see that destroyed. Uh, the problem I have with the solar panels is, again, the 25, 30 years down the road, what's it going to be? I know we sat down and had a meeting last week with a representative from the solar panel company that wants to put it in. I listened to all of his arguments and his debates and everything on it. Then I asked him, I said, well, how long have you worked? How long have you been working in solar panels? I mean, he had all the right answers that we had for the questions. Four days. He took all the classes that the company gave him with all the information that he needed to present. He didn't have any background. He didn't have any experience. He didn't have any knowledge of what the rest of it was. All he had was a sales package. All I'm asking is, think about what the county is going to be 25 or 30 years from now. This solar farm, solar panels, is a fad. It's temporary. But we're the ones that's going to be paying for it 25, 30 years down the road because the land's going to be in that situation. You're not going to be able to dispose of the panels because of the contamination. Everything's going to be shut down because you'll go to a new type of energy. Amelia County is sitting here with the junk at the rest of the county, like Chesterfield, Powhatan, all energy pulling the power off of to build our new subdivisions and stuff like that. So I just ask if you think about that in the long run, what it's going to amount to for this county in the future. So if you could turn it into a panel, panel county, that's what it's going to be. Like I said, I don't think it's my right to tell either one of you how to run your own property. Just like I don't think it's your right to tell me how to run my property. When you have ownership, it doesn't mean much in this country anymore, but it's still got a little bit of hold on. It's up to the farmers what to do with it, but it's up to the county to decide, for the board to decide, is this the kind of element that's going to be in the, in the county in the future? And I'm not just talking about solar panels. That's going to relate to other things that's going to come down the pike also. Thank you. Anybody else? would like to speak. My name is Elizabeth Bradshaw Paget Schaefer, 4808 Little Flock Church Lane, Amelia, Virginia. I've spoken before um, about my desire to help in any way possible with my professional experience in regards to IT. Um, I didn't have the time this month to prepare anything to necessarily be useful for you all. I wanted to elaborate more on the CGIS compliance issues um, that I mentioned last month um, by putting it the 200 plus document into a spreadsheet so that you could see where and if those compliance measures are being addressed. I just wanted to reiterate for the community that may not have heard me speak before. Um, I'm married to a professional firefighter whom we started our careers in firefighting locally in Amelia County. So thank you. That's our bread and butter now. Um, I have two kids in Amelia County Public School. I've worked very closely, uh, probably 16 years with the state. I currently and have supported for eight years or more with a state agency, public safety department, police department. I know federal and state guidelines, IT governance processes, procurement measures, state and federal contracts that you can actually use to procure assets and inventory or applications and systems. I'm abreast of where technology is going in the public safety environment on a county level as well. Um, platform services, we're moving away from hardware and going more to the cloud environment where dashboards and platforms are really where technology is going. And um, 
the primary vendors are motivated to take on all things IT in an individual area. So streamline of support and service and agreements, and which would be cost effective for a small county like ours. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. Anybody else? Yes, I'd like to speak. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right, thank you, Robbie. Anybody else? All right, this time I'll close the public hearing. Public comment. We'll, we'll move on to our regular agenda. General District Court renovation. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tom Stark. I am the judge of the presiding in the Amelia County General District Court. And I want to address the board tonight on uh, a decision they will have to make in the future, but want to be here on the ground floor to make some comments to the board about uh, making our public courts building accessible and useful. So when the public comes to our courts building because they have been accused of a crime, accused of a traffic infraction, or because they've been a victim or a witness to a crime, or perhaps they come to seek resolution of a business dispute in a civil case, they often need to meet in private with an attorney, either their attorney, Commonwealth's attorney, other on the other side, perhaps, to gain information or advice or to make quiet reflection about a decision they have to make before appearing before the court. The part of that diagram that I want to draw your attention to is this part right here. It is called the witness and counsel room. It is right directly next to the existing general district court clerk's office. So it is our building today is not well suited to allow access to the public in an easy fashion, in a fashion that can give security to the other members of the court, to the other citizens there. Uh, and so there, what, we are, what I will be asking you to consider um, is that in the future, as we renovate this building, that we create a public access right there. Perhaps a sidewalk would be necessary coming to the sidewalk, which is down here. So that the attorneys and litigants and people who have to use our court's building can have that room to meet before they appear before the court in a manner where they're not causing a security problem for the sheriff, in a manner in which our Commonwealth's attorney and other attorneys who meet there can have that opportunity to be speaking confidentially, to discuss the pros and cons of their decisions, and to come to a good decision without interfering with the rest of the court's business as it is going on. I have uh, in support with me tonight, I have uh, Ms. Terry Royal, who is the judge of the media Juvenile Domestic Relations Court. Uh, also with me tonight is the Commonwealth's attorney, Mr. Lee Harrison and his staff. And Ms. Gill, who is the clerk of the Amelia uh, District Court, and it is a combined court, the General District on the Juvenile Domestic Relations. I've also spoken with the sheriff about this issue, and Certainly the sheriff's main concern is security to the public and security to those in the court. And I believe I have the sheriff's support also. I would be glad to appear before this court, or before this board, <laughs> and answer any questions you have in the future at the correct time that you deem it appropriate. Uh, when you get to a more advanced position in making decisions about how the space in the court will be used given the use of the old um, Wells Fargo 
Central Fidelity Bank, uh, what other bank it was before it got to Wells Fargo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Gary. Oh, Mr. Chairman, there is one other thing. If, if I could borrow just a little bit more of your time, because I mentioned that our district courts, and I say courts being plural, we have a general district court, we have a juvenile domestic relations court, and it is a combined court. And our clerk, Ms. Melissa Gill, is the clerk of each of those combined courts. She has to know all of the different rules, procedures, practices, forms, and policies that apply to each court and to keep those courts operating. She is a member of the Association of Clerks of the District Courts of Virginia. And each year, that organization considers nominations for the Outstanding Employee of the Year. Their purpose is to establish a peer-nominated program to recognize general district and juvenile domestic relations court employees for their outstanding achievement, excellent work ethic, and distinguished service. The Association of Clerks Recognition Program recognizes employees who have displayed and sustained exceptional dedication and work performance and who have gone above and beyond the call of duty throughout the year. March of 2022, the clerk of the Powhatan General District Courts became ill. She could no longer perform her duties. It was at that time, out of dedication to a friend, dedication to the courts, that Ms. Gill volunteered to step forward to assume the duties of not only keeping Powhatan's general district courts running, but keeping Amelia's courts running at the same time. She spent many, many hours, probably sleepless hours, wondering how she was going to do that. In the process, we lost an employee in addition to the clerk in Powhatan. In addition to that, she recruited and she hired and she began the training of a new employee in Powhatan. She used her resources here in Amelia to keep work done updated from Powhatan in Amelia. She recruited other clerks from Dinwiddie, Petersburg, and Nottaway, some of whom are here tonight to pay tribute to Ms. Gill. It is, um, it was a, a, a performance that was exceptional. It was performance that was above and beyond the call of duty. It was performance that showed a selflessness and dedication to her family, to her friends, to the people that she worked with, and to the ideal of a court. Because in her 20 some years of service, I don't want to say how many, 27 years of service to the district courts in the Commonwealth of Virginia, Ms. Gill knows what a court should be. She has a concept of how it should operate. And she has dedicated her life to see that that happens. And she dedicated herself to the fact that Powhatan would not fail, and Amelia would not fail, and she succeeded. Thanks to the efforts of Judge Royal and Judge Leupold, the Clerks Association for the District Courts of Virginia has chosen Melissa Gill as the Employee of the Year for the year 2020. Thank you. 
One other little tidbit I thought I would throw in there that Ms. Gill is uh, also particularly proud of. Her mother won the same award some years ago at the end of her <laughs> career as a clerk to a general district board. Now, Mr. Chairman, I've taken up a lot of your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, George. You. Thank you. Right, Ms. Worley. Good evening. Uh, just to provide some highlights on Amelia Area Headquarters maintenance activities for the last month, we've started our first round of primary and secondary mowing. Um, you'll see we're partway through Route 360 and are continuing to work on that route, as well as 153 and 38 and secondary roads. Um, we've done three pipe replacements over the last month on Route 612 Richmond Road, Route 608 Little Patrick Road, and Route 614 Dennisville Road. Um, we performed street sweeping in the courthouse area in advance of Amelia Day a couple weeks ago, and we're currently in preparation for the bridge replacement, which will begin on June 13th on Dykeland Road. Um, met of several weeks ago now um, regarding the secondary six-year plan coordination and potential projects um, that's later in your agenda and i'll be presenting that as well um, from a construction standpoint of uh, the route 360 bridge replacement projects are ongoing um, with periodic flagging operations on 360 business that contractor is currently still on schedule to complete the project by july of this year um, surface treatment schedules, um, that contractor has started to begin some um, pavement marking eradication in advance of that schedule, and the actual surface treatment work should be completed later in the summer, um, starting in June or July. Route 636 North Lodore Road bridge scour repairs, um, similar to what were done on the 360 bridges over the Appomattox at the Chesterfield County line, are currently scheduled to begin begin in July of this year, and we anticipate an eight-week closure. Um, once we have an exact date on that, we'll work to get a press release out, as well as um, notify the county so that um, everyone's aware of that detour and closure in advance. And then, as I mentioned previously, Route 632 Dykeland Road is scheduled to begin June 13th with a three-month closure. And our communication staff has prepared a press release, which is forthcoming with a detour. Um, and we'll certainly share that information with the county as well. So fire and EMS and all county staff is aware of that closure. Um, and that's all I have for the monthly report, unless there are any questions. Thank you, Ms. Worley. Any questions from board members? Sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. All right, the school board. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Harvey. Our ADM for the fiscal year of 22 is 1563. I'd like to share with you that our high school was recently named one of the 100 best wise high schools in the nation for teaching personal finance. Quite an accomplishment. We're very proud of our high school. Um, the last day of school is next Thursday. The elementary school will celebrate with Super Kids Day on that date. Kindergarten promotion is this Friday. Fifth grade promotion is Monday at 1030. And eighth grade promotion is Wednesday the 25th at 9 o'clock. Graduation will be held this Saturday at 10 even with the temperatures expected to be at 97 degrees, um, it will be at the county stadium 
and tickets to graduation are distributed to students the day prior to the event. Our employee banquet, uh, acknowledging our teachers of the year for each school and our retirees is scheduled for Tuesday the 24th at 5 p.m. In your board packet, you have an April finance reports. We're operating well within our budget. And if you have any questions, Ms. Bullock is also here to answer those. Thank you, Ms. Hawk. Any board members have any questions? Thank you. All right, that brings us to the Board of Supervisors activities and committee reports. We start. I uh, had a uh, Piedmont Senior Resource meeting uh, last night, and uh, they just wanted to say that their Kentucky Derby fundraiser was a great success. They uh, cleared $21,000 for one afternoon's event. Uh, they having a uh, COVID vaccine uh, day on Wednesday, May 25th from 2 to 6.30. Everybody's inv invited. It's at their office, which is in Farmville, beside the, uh, in the shopping center with Buffalo Wild Wings. They said that they're going to have uh, refreshments and that the public's invited. You come get you a booster all the different types they're going to have at and that they're in a desperate need looking for a part-time nurse uh hours are very flexible pay is well that's between the nurse and them but they they are really uh, in need of one you can work one day two days full-time whatever they're very lenient on that uh crc everything was about normal or nothing really jumped out that is different. That's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. White? So over the last month, uh, went to uh, participate in a budget meeting, our radio project meeting, video meeting, library meeting, and we had a short uh, meeting on the ARPA funds last week. Um, I do have two committee updates. Uh, the library will have an opening July um, for a uh, board of trustees member. Uh, they, it is an at large position and they've reduced the amount of uh, members on their board down to nine, but they'll be, with the, this last one coming off, they'll be at eight. So they will need another member. So uh, it's at large. So if anybody in the county or community is interested in it, uh, contact any of your supervisors or you're welcome to contact me and I'll get the information over to the uh, library as well and we'd be happy to nom nominate them for you and on another note the uh workforce board is still looking for a rep for amelia um two qualifications you must be a business owner and you must live in amelia those are the only qualifications for it it's a it's a good board they basically try to help figure out how to get people hired how to get people trained and um particularly in the trades which is definitely what we need right now so if anybody's interested in that, um, contact the uh, county office or contact myself and uh, we'll get you in touch with the right people. Thank you, Mr. White. Mr. Robinson. I did not make it to my PSR meeting last night. Kind of got tied up. We had a emergency CPMT meeting last month. Really can't discuss anything that we do there because it's all kind of private and pretty much that's about it. Thank you, Mr. Robson. Mr. Easter? Um, mostly standard meetings over the last month. Um, I'll just take a moment of this time, though. You've heard a lot from me about Crossroads and including the fabulous hiring of our new executive director. And I want to acknowledge Dr. Melba Moore is here tonight not asking her to speak and not putting her on the spot, but we would like to welcome her to lead a very um, important organization for Amelia and our surrounding counties. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. 
Thank you, Mr. Easter. Um, Planning Commission, just kind of the normal meetings. I was at the one with Mr. Wyatt on the radio project. That's moving along. Piedmont Regional Jail, we're holding steady with our same amount of residents there. Just, just the same meeting. All right, moving on along. We have a conditional rezoning for Mr. Roy Langford. We've already had the public hearing. I think the agenda says a public hearing, but we had that last month. Ms. Steele, would you like to fill us in on that? Give a quick recap on that. Um, Mr. Langford is requesting a conditional rezoning um, of his property from A5 Ag to M2 Industrial. He's proposing to use the land to reinstall a concrete plant that operated on the property historically. Um, if this is approved, he's offered the following voluntary proffers. The hours of operation will be from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. The operation will remain at least 100 feet from all property lines. He will comply with all DEQ and EPA regulations, and the use will be limited to a maximum of 1.5 acres of the parcel. And I've not received any additional comments or concerns since our last public hearing. Okay, thank you, Ms. Steele. What's the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, as this is in uh, my district and I've had the fabulous opportunity to meet with Mr. Langford and, and visit the site and go over the operations, I'd like to make a motion to approve his request. Thank you, Mr. Easter. Motion on the floor to approve Mr. Langford's request. Any more discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. Carries. All right, that gets us into some older business. Uh, Mr. Harvey, would you like to explain the VADI grant? Sure. Uh, the VADI grant is uh, a grant that we applied for <clears throat> with River Street and applied through a group with the West Piedmont Planning District Commission. It was awarded, and this agreement is between Amelia and River Street, West Piedmont. They're referred to as the party. It's to build a fiber to the home network. River Street has already been awarded $1,172,000 through RDAW funding. They're gonna use that, plus $17,885,527,000 of the VADI grant that was assigned to Amelia County. This project is designed to run service past 3,800 locations. The County of Amelia, and it's up to 352 miles of fiber optic cable. The total project is gonna to amount to $26,581,694. The county agrees to provide at least $3,713,897. The uh, uh, ARPA funding that we have uncommitted in the bank right now, which was designated for broadband, is $2,151,516. And we also had the money that we put towards the Tobacco Commission grant. Uh, that was, I don't have that exact figure, that was about $800,000. We haven't gotten a confirmation from the Tobacco Commission that they're gonna let us shift the funding award that they gave us for the wireless project over to this, but we anticipate that they will. And so this this agreement is uh, been, it's there for your review. If you've got any questions, I think Mr. Gore, myself, would be able to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Any questions from the board members? This project's been going on for a while. Grant just finally come through, so. Yeah. Comment. Cool. Agreed with you about the long time, but I think it's really important to make sure citizens are really clear while this is still River Street, it's at a very different project than the original one. So the original one was for wireless broadband. And as just in the last couple of years, technology has changed so much, it's now feasible to do this is fiber to the home. So these are physical connections to as Mr. Harvey said, over 3,800 homes in the county. 
That's all homes that are deemed right now by the federal government not to have broadband capabilities. So we are not spending, as we've said it before, we're not spending any money on the existing wireless project because River Street took that on totally on their own and said the county does not have to follow through with that. So we do, as Mr. Harvey said, have pretty much all the funding available from sources outside of the county for our portion. Very different technology than what's been done in the past and should have much better benefits. Sure. Chair, one thing to add, uh, as a critical distinction, this is a new project um, with largely federal and state funding and court funding from that, from the company. But it also has a three-year uh, deadline under the contract. So the agreement that's under consideration tonight and the grant agreement that will follow along once DHCD provides that, because um, it's being all run through the Department of Housing and Community Development, and they're the ones administering the grant um, from the state side. Um, uh, it requires uh, the whole project to be done within three years. So uh, I've, some of these projects have already begun. Uh, so I, I do think the state fully expects this money to be spent and the fiber to be run uh, to the homes within that time frame. Um, and I would expect probably shorter time period once once they start. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gore. What's the pleasure of the board? Move forward with this and this agreement. I'm happy to make a motion to um, proceed forward and approve the agreement. Is there a motion on the floor to proceed with forward with this? All in favor, raise your hand. Carries. All right, the Manborough Tower. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is more River Street. Um, this is part of the wireless program that we started out with them. This is going to be the only phase that they're going to do because there had been so many problems uh, with successful uh, connections. They had agreed that they would pay for the tower. This is not going to cost Amelia County anything in order to... Uh, to make it so they could do it with their uh, auditing requirements and different things. We need to assign the ground lease agreement that the county has with the property owner. And if you take a look at the agreement under section 10, it says that the tenant may, uh, with or without the landlord's consent or approval, assign its rights and obligations to River Street's LLC network and or and any affiliate as long as the tenant is under contract with river street to co-locate on the co-locate on the communications tower located on the premises and i have talked to the property owner he's fine with it whether it was a sublet or a assignment he was good to go with that so if uh, if the board sees fit to approve um, assigning this ground ground lease agreement to River Street, that will move forward. And I actually talked to the, the landowner today, and he said he had been in contact with the contractor who's going to erect it from Georgia. They've been communicating, and we didn't even, uh, we really weren't aware of it. So I think we're all tired of the fits and starts. It, uh, we thought this thing would have been completed uh, months ago, but we're right there now for this one. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. <clears throat> and with that tower, that will give a place for emergency services to put some equipment on it, too. That's correct. All right, what's the pleasure of the board on this? Anybody want to put any form of a motion to move forward? Yeah, I think we can go ahead and make a motion to move forward with it. I think it'll all be pretty decent. I've not talked to Shannon Smith about it. Thank you, Mr. Robson. There's a motion on the floor to ex accept the agreement and move forward. Any more discussion? Chairman, just for clarification, um, 
the, the motion would be to approve assigning the ground lease uh, to River Street. Okay. Mr. Robson, would you like to amend your motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the signing of the ground lease. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robson. Any more discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, media County Technology Systems and Social Media Policy. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, this, uh, this has been talked about several times in the last uh, couple of months, and it was actually on the board's agenda for the March of 2020 Board of Supervisors meeting. It was on the agenda and it was in the packet. Just a few days before the meeting, the pandemic struck. We were restricted to the type of meeting that we could have and the interaction that we could have. I think everybody remembers that very well. So the only items that could be acted on at that meeting were the emergency ones. For the next couple of uh, months, it, there were uh, agendas that were restricted to emergency things, and this one had just not been brought back. So we're bringing it back with the note that it's two years old, and with all the changes that have taken place in the, the meeting world, the electronic world, and different things related to COVID, what we were hoping was we could get some feedback from the board if there was anything they liked about it or they didn't. And then council was going to take it back and update it from the 22620 draft to bring it current with uh, current code. If there's anybody that's got any questions or comments, we're more than happy to receive them. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Any board members have any questions? Mr. Chairman, I just have one comment. Even with two years having passed, um, page four of the policy, section G, still hasn't been updated to remove the note um, that was done during drafting. So need to address that. And since we're discussing policies, at last month's meeting, you committed to send me the policy on surplus uh, items, which I have not received from you. And I can, uh, I can address that if you'd like. There is no written policy. So I was going to give you that in the county administrator's report. Could have done that any of the past couple of weeks. Um, so you said last month we were following policy. Uh -huh. That's not accurate then. It's it just is. do whatever we want. No, sir, it is accurate. When the county buys something, it belongs to the county. Mm -hmm. It's worn out or trash, it's taken to the trash. If it's not, it's declared surplus and it's carried to public work. Okay. Public Works will make sure that the different departments and agencies know that, it, know that it's there in case somebody else needs something very similar. They will take it. It happens very often. When stuff sits around long enough, looks like nobody's going to use it, we will carry it over to a, an auction that the school board usually has once a year. So that's, that is the policy, though it's not in writing. You're oh. absolutely right about that. Correct. You've described our practices, which are good. We don't have a policy for it. So I'd like to make a request that you document the policy and then bring it forward to us for review. Certainly. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Easter. Well, back to the, uh, the draft form here. The Treasurer and the Commission of Revenue has had some concerns. They were asked to send them to Mr. Gore, and hopefully we'll have something back. The IT committee will look at 1st of June, bring something back to the board June meeting for approval. That okay with everybody? All right. Mr. Chairman, just to add, um, so, the, so the constitutional officers are not under the county's policies generally. So um, I'm not even sure at the time when this draft was put together that it even contemplated any any oversight or any involvement of the constitutional officers. So I have yet to receive. So that's a question. That's a policy question. If if those officers and if the county want to f include them in the policy, that's something that they would all have to agree to. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm happy to, to 
I haven't received anything yet from any I'll forward you their feedback now. They sent it to all of us. I'll yeah, forward it to you. I'm happy to, to explain. We don't have authority that. over them, so I don't think we anticipate. That's, yeah, that's right. It would have to be sort of a voluntary. I'll forward you their feedback. I think they're planning on doing their own. Which makes sense, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Gore. Any more comments or discussion? Brings us to the cash match. Is Ms. Foster in the audience? She's supposed to be online. I am. Can you hear me? There she is. Yes, sir. Melody, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Can you, can you hear yes. us? Yes, I can. The screen says you're speaking. There you go. Can you hear me? I noticed earlier you had another person and they couldn't. Not sure if y'all's end is working. Melody, it sounds like there's something going on on our end that we cannot get your audio. Okay. We have all the information in our packet and we've discussed this at a previous meeting. Can we just move forward? Robert? No, just do it. Second. Does anybody have any questions for Melody that maybe we could uh, we could hear and email us an answer back? It seemed like it was pretty cut and dried, the yep. uh, application. Mr. Harvey, can you can you give us a brief overview of this? I didn't prepare for this one. Okay. Um, this is a uh, this is a grant application by the CRC to go Virginia, our go Virginia region. They're asking us for $2,500. They want to study the building of a regional economic development organization. And there's some pretty hefty numbers in the back of it that I think they're contemplating the organization may require, but that's what the study is for. I think what they're asking for is the $2,500 for the grant application to act as the match for Go, to, Go Virginia to pick the rest up. We were going to provide some in-kind donation too. That's true. The, they're asking Go Virginia for $100,000. And they're going to come up with fifty thousand uh, dollars cash and in kind matches. Okay, thank you, Mr. Harvey. Board have any discussion on this? Comment? I'm assuming this is this a, requires a vote. Yes, sir. How will we benefit? As a million. Agreed. Previous version of this was stood down because it wasn't providing value. We already, as a board, keep questioning the value that CRC is providing for Amelia. I, I have to agree with Mr. Robinson. I, I don't see the value for Amelia. Okay. Might want to put it in a motion. I'm going to try one more time. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Oh, excellent. Um, can I make a few comments? 
All right, hold on, Melody. It looks like they <laughs> muted you because you were so loud in here. Sorry. <laughs> we're going to get it. Try that, please. Okay. Is that too loud now? Much better. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that earlier. I think you had an earlier person who wanted to speak at the public um, comment and you weren't able to hear her either as well. Um, I just wanted to point out that, you know, the Commonwealth Regional Council was requested to facilitate discussions about the creation of a new regional economic development organization for the footprint of the CRC. Um, it also involves the partnership of Longwood University, which Longwood has agreed to be a partner in this. And as you said, I, I think a lot of the localities that were a member of their uh, organization before didn't feel a value. And that's the whole point of doing a study through Go Virginia to look at creating a business plan to um, study what would be you know, the benefit for all the seven counties and Longwood University. Um, on the second page there, the summary, you know, would conduct an analysis, conduct market demand analysis, site and building inventory analysis, the creation of the board and operational structure design, including a legal structure, um, develop vision goals and strategy, and develop a budget and sustainability plan for three years, including fundraising campaign framework. And then most importantly, make sure there are defined measures of success. This is not saying that the, it immediately would be stood up as a new organization, but it would study it to, like you said, help come up with a vision with all of you providing input so that you would have a buy-in to this new organization and you would get some measure of success out of it and feel like you could get a return on investment. Um, each locality and Long University has asked for $2,500 cash match for this. Um, the localities that have already committed to this are Buckingham, Charlotte, Lunenburg, Prince Edward, and Longwood University. Um, your meeting is tonight. Um, Cumberland is going to be getting back with me, and the Nottaway's meeting is on May 26. So I just wanted to make sure there's a few clarifications there. And then also the Commonwealth Regional Council has committed $10,000 in cash to show our financial commitment to this um, creation of a new organization as well. And I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Lawson. Do I? Melody, if you couldn't hear me, it's going to sit for a month and maybe come back. Okay. No action was taken on it. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm hmm all right, moving on, special event permit for the Lavender Festival. Yes, the Windsor Lavender Farm has applied for a special event permit for a Lavender Festival to be held Saturday, June 11th from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, they're located on Burton Road. They're gonna be having arts and crafts, food vendors, lavender products, and live music, and they're expecting between 500 to 1,000 people. Um, in talking to the applicant, he has gotten significantly more interest in the festival since he gave this, so I would anticipate a lot more than 1,000 people there. Um, there were no comments from any department heads and agencies. The only thing was the rescue squad advised that if there would be alcohol, they would like one standby ambulance. Not required, but they are advising it. And when he applied, the applicant was not yet sure. He had not secured a vendor that would have alcohol, but that is a possibility. That's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Steele. Board have any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve with the same stipulation as last month that we not, not proceed with any fees from the rescue squad until they fully document their process and expectations around fees. Thank you, Mr. Easter. motion on the floor to 
pass this with the exceptions of the fees. Any more discussion? In favor, raise your hand. We carry it. Ms. Worley? I had a meeting with Ms. Worley about a week ago just to get to schedule how we wanted to do this on the six year plan. Nothing has really changed. We made no changes, but just to bring what was here last year, she will be presenting. So I'll provide a very brief overview on the secondary six year plan and um, kind of your options going forward this year on passing a resolution. So the secondary six year plan was created as a partnership between VDOT and the locality, the County Board of Supervisors um, to improve local transportation. Um, the Board of Supervisors as part of the secondary six year plan has the responsibility for establishing their priorities for projects that should be included in that plan. And then VDOT in turn funds them with those secondary road funds in order of the priority that the board establishes. Um, proposed new funding allocations to individual projects do require a public hearing, um, and that's the Code of Virginia reference um, included there in the presentation slide. So there are two types of secondary six-year plan funds that are allocated to Amelia County. The first is the unpaved secondary roads fund. These monies are specifically to be used on unpaved roads carrying more than 50 vehicles per day that are already in VDOT's state system for maintenance. And these funds are distributed based on a ratio of the number of unpaved roads in the county versus the total number in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And then the second um, type of funds that are available are telecommunications fees or telefees for short. And these are public right of way use fees um, that we receive for um, telecommunication um, use of the right of way in Amelia County. And that money is returned to the county through the secondary six year plan. So again, I spoke on this a uh, second ago, but the specific use of those fees, um, the unpaved roads can only be used for hard surfacing current secondary unpaved roads, but the telecommunications fees um, do not have restrictions. They can be used on other improvements on secondary roads, or they can also be used to supplement your unpaved road funds. You've all received a packet of information. This slide is the first sheet that's in your packet, and it um, just shows the estimated allocations that Amelia County is anticipated to receive for both telefees and unpaved road funds in fiscal year 23, which starts July 1st, 2022, through fiscal year 2028. So you can see the estimated allocations um, that you'll be receiving over the next six years. Um, just as a reminder, your current secondary six-year plan um, which is shown on your second document in your packets that you have. Last year, the board opted to add two rural rustic projects to your secondary six-year plan, Route 621 Folksbridge Road and Route 657 Selma Road, um, just the dead end section from Genito to the end. Um, and both of those projects, you can see how they're funded in um, that spreadsheet in your secondary six-year plan but for a total of 298,000 um, construction funds for Route 621, and that's scheduled to go to construction next summer, and then 130,000 for Selma Road, which is scheduled to go to construction this summer. We also have two additional funds um, in your secondary six-year plan that I think were established many years ago, one for countywide rural additions um, to bring private roads into the state system, and then countywide engineering and surveying. Um, to my knowledge, we have not recently um, used any funds for rural additions in Amelia County in recent history, and both of those funds are currently serving as more monitoring funds account, kind of holding pots until um, 
the board might opt to assign them to a specific project. Um, so just to touch a little bit on previous funds, you can carry over funds from previous years. So that's what you'll see in your spreadsheet. There's a column before fiscal year 23 that shows how we've allocated the previous funds to those two specific projects and to those two um, kind of holding pots. So previous funds that are not specifically allocated to one of those two rural rustics, you currently have $146,352 um, that are currently allocated to those two monitoring funds accounts. And then in fiscal year 23, um, based on adding Route 621 to your plan last year, um, we'll be using the fiscal year 23 funds to complete the funding for that project to get us to the total of 298,000. And then the remaining $59,633 is not currently allocated to a specific project. That again is just shown in one of those monitoring funds account. So in total, starting July 1, there will be $205,985 that is not set to a specific project, Route 621 or Route 657. Um, so a couple options that are available. Um, the board is certainly welcome to add additional projects to the secondary six-year plan, and we would fund them in order of the priority that they're given by the board. Um, I mentioned those $205,000. You have um, rural rustics that might exceed that cost. They could certainly be added to the plan, and then we would just continue to fund them in future years as that funding becomes available. Um, or the board also has the option to pass a resolution with the six-year plan as it currently stands and just to allow those additional funds to accrue in those monitoring funds account. Um, so those are just two potential options that you have available to you. Um, there is a third sheet in your packet that shows all unpaved roads that are in VDOT's um, system in Amelia County. The ones that are highlighted in green are eligible for the Rural Rustic Program for hard surfacing um, based on the traffic volume, the 50 vehicles per day that's required for that Rural Rustic Program. Um, and then the others, I've listed the traffic volume so you can see how close they are. Um, and there are um, cost estimates associated with those potential Rural Rustic projects for your consideration. And that is all I have if there are any questions. Thank you, Ms. Worley. Does anybody have any concerns on how we want to proceed? Do we want to assign roads or do we want to let the count build up? We'll do a whole lot with 205,000. I know Folks Bridge only point were two big roads in my district. Folks is going to get redone when they finish the bridge work. Correct. Yes, it's currently closed, so we're not able to do that one this construction season. So we'll do it in 2023. And that has put a lot of traffic on the Stony Point Road. The road is not holding up that well. I'd like to see Stony Point Road put in a plan. Anybody else have anything? The uh, Selma Road to the dead end, road's mighty narrow. Y'all talking about paving it? Is that what you're talking about on the upgrades? It would be surface treatment, so hard surfacing. Um, so the Rural Rustic Program is designed to keep the rural nature of the roadway, um, but reestablish ditches so that we have clear drainage and provide a hard surface for that road. So if there is widening, widening it would be very minimal. Um, yeah, I think you're going to have to do some. I right. rode by there this morning, and I just happened to look down there because I was turning on Selma the other way, and I just noticed, I said, you can't pass on that road. It's so narrow.
All right, what's the board's pleasure? Have a pleasure? Well, since we're doing Selma Road this year, I'd, I'd make a motion we put Stony Point Road in. Any There's a motion on the floor. Any more discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. All right, thank you, Ms. Worley. All right, I'll draft the resolution with Mr. Harvey um, in preparation for a public hearing next month. Okay, that's appropriate. Thank, thank you. All right, that brings us to the, we have three public hearings. And Mr. Gore, if I'm correct, we need to go in this order. That's right. Okay. Do you want to speak on the revenue share? Yes, sir. So um, what's been advertised for public hearing uh, first, a uh, series of solar-related uh, public hearings. The, other, the others are project specific. This is not. So this is an ordinance um, that would authorize the county to uh, assess a fee of $1,400 per megawatt um, to utility scale solar projects uh, per year. So that's projects over five megawatts. Um, the General Assembly in 2020 uh, passed this legislation um, as a way to provide uh, uh, another option for counties, for localities to uh, get some revenue off of these projects. And so um, all it does is codify what the state code section says. It does not approve any specific project. It does not uh, do anything other than put on the county, into the county code, uh, a, uh, a revenue uh, revenue share um, chapter that would uh, apply to projects that fit with the state law so it would just put it on the books it doesn't it doesn't uh, require it doesn't lead directly to any approval of any specific project it just tracks state law now one thing to understand is um, when a when a local when the general assembly passed this law, of course it gives with one hand it takes away with the other so uh, while while this revenue vehicle was authorized um, sort of the price of it is to forego any machinery and tools tax on the um, prop on the on the personal property tangible property related to a project like this so um, so so we did worked with the Commissioner of Revenue and, and sort of did an analysis based on a proposed project just to see how the county tax rates uh, for machinery and tools would compare to the revenue produced by a significantly sized project through this revenue share ordinance. And it was it was pretty clear that in Amelia's case that the revenue share uh, provisions would, would, would produce significantly more county revenue than simply relying on the old M&T tax. So that, that calculation varies from locality to locality, it just depended on tax rates and, and other factors, but uh, it was a pretty clear cut case in Amelia that this was a better option than relying on m and Just wanted to make sure everyone knew and the public knew that if, if this were to be adopted, then for any projects that fit this ordinance and fit the state law, um, it would just be this source of revenue as far as taxes, not the m and tax. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gore. And, and it also, Mr. Chairman, it provides that the tax, that, that the set, that the fee would escalate uh, by five, by 10, by 10% every five years. So again, this is all in the state law and this that's what this ordinance tracks. So it would escalate, it's not static at $1,400 per megawatt. Okay, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's all, that's all I have. Any board members have any questions? All right, at this time I'm gonna open the public hearing. This is just on the revenue sharing ordinance. Anybody have any comments on this? All 
All right, I'll close the public hearing. Any board members have any comments? Well, it's a pleasure to the board to accept this or pass this ordinance to have this in place for other. <clears throat> or do we want to hear all of them first? Make a motion to approve this. Yeah. There's a motion on the floor to approve the revenue sharing ordinance. Presented. For discussion. Favor, raise your hand. Motion carries. All right. Now we're down to the Special exemption permit for media energy facility. Ms. Holly, you want to give a, Ms. Steele, you want to give a brief overview? Yes. Um, I'm going to try to not talk as much as I normally do because Torch also has a presentation they're going to give. Um, and you probably don't want to hear my voice all night. So, Amelia Energy Facility LLC has applied for a special exception permit to operate a utility scale solar facility on five parcels with a combined acreage of 1,103 acres. The proposed project is located east of Buckskin Creek, north of Old Courthouse Road and west of West Creek Road. Of those 1,103 acres, there will only be solar panels on approximately 635. And we have a condition that says it is a maximum of 650 if this were to get approved. The remainder of the land will be used to meet building setbacks and achieve the required landscaping buffer. The applicants have removed nearly all of the agricultural land from the project and will be constructing the facility on land that's currently forested. Per our comprehensive plan, this project's located within the rural preservation area. Chapter five of our comp plan discusses the future land use plan for the county. And in rural and agricultural preservation areas in which this project is proposed, the plan states that the intention of this area is to promote existing farming, agricultural industry, and companion land uses to include utility scale solar energy systems or other green energy generation systems. Um, and we amended the comprehensive plan in 2019 to specifically add that in there. If this project is approved, the applicants will be subject to the following conditions. Um, the first 13 are standard conditions that are in our ordinance that we've required for the first two solar projects as well. Um, those pertain to compliance with the building and electrical codes, installation and design, location, density, required setbacks, height, lighting, utility connection, screening and fencing, noise limits, signage, site maintenance, and repair of panels. In addition to the standard conditions, um, I would like to add there shall be no battery storage permitted. The maximum acreage under panels shall not exceed 650 acres. Work shall only be performed from dawn until dusk. And then also on May 10th, the applicants voluntarily conditioned five more things. So, they will be complying with their revised preliminary plan, which is the one you all see before you. Um, they will reimburse the county for a third party inspector for all review of erosion and sediment control and stormwater inspections plans, all of those things. Um, the permit holder will not install solar panels or any equipment within 1000 feet of any residence occupied at the time of the approval. And that does not include fencing, stormwater, and erosion and sediment control measures. The permit holder will establish and maintain two 50 foot wide wildlife corridors. And the last condition is that topsoil moved during construction will be kept on the project area and used in the establishment of ground cover. Um, all right. Yes, that is all the conditions. Um, and the planning commission Recommended denial of this by a vote of six to four to one, and they held their public hearing in March. So that is all I have, but like I said, I know Torch also has a presentation. 
that they would like to do before we go into the public hearing, if that's all right with you all. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Steele. Any board members have any questions? No. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner, uh, Board of Supervisors, and um, and and the community. Um, I guess to start off, my name is Scott Leach. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm the Senior Vice President here at Torch Clean Energy, um, and uh, my background: I've been doing solar developments of this scale for the past 15 years, and so we've done it from. Is that better? Much better. All right. Um, so I've been working in the solar industry at utility scale projects for the past 15 years. Uh, and those projects have been all over the country, all the way from Florida up to Vermont, California to Michigan, uh, and a number of developments here in, in the mid Atlantic. Um, by way of background, torch clean energy has been around since the mid 2000s and our focus as a company is developing projects from initial concept all the way through to the start of construction. Um, we hire a third party company to build the project, but then after that we will go on to own, own those projects long term. So we're both here as the initial face of this project and introducing it to the community, but we're also intending to be here for the duration of its life. And I'll touch on some of those points uh, a little bit later. The slide here says that we have nine projects like this here in Virginia, but it's actually now 10, maybe 11 that we have been actively uh, developing. They're all in different stages. For example, the Bartonsville project, um, which is up in Frederick County, has received its conditional use uh, approval um, over the past couple of years, and it's going to be breaking ground this year uh, to build that project. Um, we have offices both in Colorado and here in Virginia. Um, and we have been uh, actively engaged both here in Amelia County and also all over the state on projects of this scale. So if you could go to the next slide. What the next slide will show uh, is that we... Sir, you've got oh, the controller got the... right there. Oh, there, there you, you go. go. I'm in control. <laughs> Um, so we do everything from um, the initial development work, citing projects, doing all the technical studies, understanding how you can inject a project of and this energy onto the grid, um, all the way through to working with uh, utility companies like Dominion Energy to sell them power. And obviously solar energy is just one part of our energy mix. We need natural gas, we need coal, we need nuclear, all of the above. And there's reasons why utilities find solar energy attractive, and there's also reasons why utilities find natural gas projects attractive. Um, and so this is just part of the energy mix that we're working on here. Um, in terms of our meeting here tonight, this is the culmination of a number of meetings here with the community. And um, it is our local conditional use permit that you all are considering today. After this stage, we will then go on to the state and receive a state level approval under something called a permit by rule. And so this is not the end of our journey in the permitting, but it certainly is one of the most important parts because it's how we integrate this project into your community. It's really where we have been spending the past six months listening to feedback from the community and adapting that project so that can fit into um, the original footprint that you that we started with and now what you see today. When you think about the components of this project, a solar, a solar facility that we're considering to, to build here is a single axis tracking project. The panels that we use here are the same panels that you see on people's homes. So it starts with putting racking into the ground, which is basically like a converted guardrail technology. There's a pivot point that's put up on those posts that allows the solar panels to kind of uh, in, the, in, in the morning time face east and in the evening face west. That design right here is about um, 
seven to nine feet off of the ground. So from a view ship point of view, it really is not that tall. Um, right now we're considering a game fence that surrounds that project for safety concerns. And then lastly, there is a inverter transformer uh, modular unit that combines those solar power, that energy that's produced there, and then steps it up internally to the project to a distribution level of voltage, which is the same voltage that we see around town here. It's not until we get to the transmission line that we step it up to the higher voltage, and then that gets put onto the grid. When you think about these modular units, even though each one is its own building block, we have been able to take those building blocks and change the footprint of the project and shrink it to the 230 acres here that you guys are reviewing today, pull it off of farmlands like we've heard from the community, and then shrink it down so it's 1,000 feet away from the closest neighbor. Now, Sam is going to get into some of the details of, um, of the project. But in almost every community we enter into, we are the first project of this type. And we understand that there are some concerns that community has that we heard earlier today and maybe later in this hearing. Tonight, we heard really two, two points. The first one had to do with real estate values. And that is some information that we're going to present on tonight that's very close to home in Powhatan County, where we compare home values before a solar project went in and home values after the solar project went in. And we will present to you that information. In addition, there was concerns about decommissioning of this project. And I think that's a really, really important point to the county, right? What's going to happen in 35 years? Well, what we have done to bridge that gap is we are confident in, in the technology, is that we are committing to give a decommissioning bond to the county. And what that does is it, it, it puts you know, money where our mouth is. If we don't show up in 35 years, there is a financial instrument that you guys can pull on that is revisited every couple of years to make sure that it's in the right amount. If one year it's too low, well, then we have to up it to make sure that that security is in your favor in the event that we need to decommission it. And so I think I wanted to hit on those two points really closely here before we kind of get into some of the details, um, because there are two very important aspects of this project. We understand people's concern about it, um, but wanted to touch base on those. I guess I'll turn it over uh, to Sam here. Good evening, uh, Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is Sam Galland. I'm a development manager with Torch. Uh, been with Torch for about four years and, and live over in Charlottesville. Um, and I wanted to start, and we're kind of getting into the specifics of the project. Um, you know, from the very beginning, this project complied with the zoning ordinance that the county passed to, to regulate solar. Um, the county identified three types of zoning for utility scale solar. This project is on entirely RP5. Uh, there were rules about the amount of land within a five mile radius, uh, how far you have to be from a village, uh, and setbacks as well. And you know, this project complies with all of those, those regulations. Um, we did try to go beyond that, beyond just kind of meeting the requirements that the county came up with. And over the last six months, really over the last year, uh, we've put a lot of effort into to meeting with neighbors, um, you know, talking to neighbors, hearing concerns from them, the planning commission as well. And we've made pretty significant changes to the project based on those conversations. So these have been mentioned, but when we first brought this project, we had several other parcels. Those parcels included farmland. They were closer to uh, folks' homes. We removed those parcels. So now we have no active farmland. We have, um, you know, tim timber land, a lot of which has already been cut, um, the rest of which is about ready to be cut. Uh, and as was mentioned, uh, we would not be installing a solar panel within a thousand feet of any existing residence uh, or any public road. So for scale, I think it's probably about 80 feet from this podium to the back uh, of the auditorium. 
So we're talking about 12 or 15 times that at the very closest. And this is not, you know, a big open area. This is generally forested areas. Uh, these are, you know, usually a stream or two in between them. So this is a very strong natural buffer. I don't think we've ever had a, you know, minimum setback um, as large as this, but it just kind of um, was possible for us to do given the location of the roads and the houses, but it's a, it's a very significant setback. Uh, Holly brought up the conditions and I'll kind of breeze over these, but the, you have a thousand foot setback. Um, and then these other things are, some of them are best practices. You know, we would never bring soil out of a project site, uh, but that's something we, we put as a condition. Uh, and on the stormwater thing, um, there are pretty rigorous requirements that the state has as far as erosion and sediment and stormwater controls. Generally, permit fees, you know, when you're doing your site plan, cover a review of that. We are offering to also cover the cost of an inspector to be on site and make sure that the project is being constructed in accordance with that plan and with those regulations. Um, the, the final thing, and I think this was mentioned, um, we will be doing a local job and vendor fair if we move forward with the project. Uh, we try to work with local folks on every project. There are advantages to that. A lot of the site work, you know, the roads, the fencing, the, you know, installation of ENS stuff um, is best done by local firms and, and we would certainly hope to do that here. This is the concept plan and as you can see the project would be broken up into at least three arrays. Uh, the boundaries here on the northern end you have the Dominion transmission line uh, that's actually the only high voltage transmission line in the county. On the east side the boundary is uh, Tanner Branch which is that pretty big wetland system there on the right. Um, so we are nowhere near, you know, West Creek Road or, or Dennisville Road. On the west side, um, you can see where Buckskin Creek Road is, but again, we're not proposing to build uh, the solar project right on the road. We're actually about 800 or 1,000 feet in on the east side of a stream. Um, so we're pretty far, pretty far from that road as well. This next slide is, is similar. This is a, you know, a conceptual plan that has some of the, the project features. These darker lines are the internal roads. So those would be gravel roads uh, that are used to get around the project. Uh, you can see the north-south running uh, rows of panels. Those rectangles are you know, possible locations for the inverters, which are those boxes about twice the size of a refrigerator that change it from direct current to alternating current. Uh, from there, uh, most of the project wiring is underground and generally follows the project roads and goes to the project substation. And we're showing two possible locations, but they're both um, right near or right on that transmission line. And that's where we step the voltage up and, and would put the power onto the grid. Um, the, the, the light green are those wildlife corridors we were talking about. Um, generally, we don't fence over wetlands or streams, but we're calling out those areas where we would have a pretty wide gap and we would also have a special fence uh, that's raised in portions so small animals can get in or get out uh, if they do come into the project uh, fenced area. Um, you know, generally this is a good project site for us. Not a lot of the land, um, you know, in this part of the county is not perfectly flat, um, but these, it's very gently rolling and especially that big array in the south, uh, it has a, a gradual southern slope. And that's actually ideal for us. Um, we don't have to grade it, but you can generate more energy when you have that southern exposure. Um, and this is actually some of the flatter area um, in the vicinity of that, of that transmission line. Uh, so we are asking, tonight we're asking for a decision, not just on the special exception, but also a siting agreement. Siting agreement's a new concept and it, it was, enacted in a law that we're required to offer it. And it's basically a tool and, and something that gives us the ability for us to offer something in addition to property taxes. Um, because solar projects have a, a long life and a dependable revenue stream, uh, we can offer a pretty good annual payment, which is what we're proposing here. Uh, and it, you know, when you look at it over the project life, it's pretty significant. Um, over, the, over the full life, those payments, both both property taxes or revenue share in this case, and the siting agreement payments would exceed 10 million. Uh, it would also be a, a big boost to the local economy. 
Um, like I said, you know, we want to work with local firms. And at the height of construction, uh, we'd be employing 300 workers. A lot of that is, you know, the work, the, the site work that is not solar specific. Um, and, and lastly, the, you know, the project is, it's not a big parking lot. It's, it's really a big meadow that has solar equipment installed on it. Um, you know, unlike crops, which are being take, taken off every year, we can put in native grasses. There are actually benefits to the farmland around it. Uh, this is not a permanent use of the land, and it could certainly go back to farming at the end of it. Um, one other thing to add, um, on that siting agreement, um, in addition to those annual payments, there are two payments um, right at the approval of the building permit, and then right when we start producing power, um, which would amount to around $1 million. So that would be a, a big upfront payment to the county as well. And I'm, I'm aware that Amelia, like, like a lot of other counties, just went through you know, the, the, a budget exercise. And we just wanted to highlight what you know, those initial payments um, could mean. And these are you know, important expenses that could be, could be offset by those initial payments rather than, than paid by the taxpayers. And this is a chart that compares you know, the current use of the property uh, to the solar project. And um, you know, obviously, the, the revenues from the solar project are, are significant. Uh, and they also don't, they don't depreciate over time. And part of that is that um, you know, the county has the revenue share thing, which escalates, but also our siting agreement payments escalate each year. So this is something that um, you know, some big investments depreciate over five years or three years. And that's not the case with a project like this. Continues to you know, to pay while it's, while it's operating. Um, you know, some, some projects that, that pay a lot of taxes also incur a lot of costs for the county, you know, whether that's schools or roads or water. Um, you know, the landfill certainly has costs on the county in terms of traffic and that kind of thing. When it's constructed, this is a very passive use. We're talking about, you know, five trips a, a month in, in traffic. Um, and it, you know, will continue to pay, um, you know, pretty good revenues year in and year out. I would say, you know, if you think about it like a 40-year project, um, you know, it's almost like you could grow pine trees again for 40 years, um, or you could, you know, construct the solar project, and it's a similar impact in terms of costs, but a very different result uh, in terms of the economic benefits. Um, I was just talking about how it's a passive use, but that's that's a project that we have in Arizona. It's actually it's kind of higher up, so the grass grows pretty well, and we've been using sheep to graze on it. Um, but as I was saying, it's a very passive use. Um, there can be benefits to the to the farmland around it, um, and would be a, a very good quiet neighbor. Um, I did want to speak a little bit about property values because we've heard we we heard that at the planning commission meeting. Um, and then we, you know, we heard that tonight. And, and I would start with a, I guess, kind of a common sense argument. And if, we're, if you look up where, you know, where we've labeled West Creek Road, um, those homes are probably about 3,000 feet from the project, over a half mile. And you know, these are panels that are, are mounted on five-foot posts. Um, and I, you know, I would not expect that the landfill is affecting property values for homes that far away. So why would, you know, something that is not increasing traffic, something that can't be seen or heard and, you know, has no smell either. Um, but we did want to look at the data that's available. And we did that for a, a project that's in, in Powhatan County. And um, some of you may know, I actually drive by this when I come here. So it's on, um, if you go by and five, it's pretty close to 522. And uh, you can see where the solar project is. And to the east of it is a, a neighborhood called uh, Mill Station. And it was, it was built pretty recently. Um, some of those homes were built pre-2015, and some were built after 2015. Um, the project was permitted and built in 2016 and 2017. Um, and to move on, so, so we looked at every home sale uh, in these relatively new neighborhoods. There were some sale prices 
before the solar project, some sale prices after the solar project. And just so you're aware, I think the closest house is about 600 feet from the project. So we're twice as far away. This is a solar project that is much closer to those homes. Um, if there was a significant property value effect, uh, you would expect to see that on this chart. So this is a uh, price per square foot over time. You would expect that to go up you know, a little bit each year, maybe go up a lot in the last two years. Um, but you're not seeing a big drop. Again, that project was built in 2016, 2017. You're not really seeing any impact there. Um, one thing about that is that you might say, well, you know, those are different houses being sold. They might be, you know, might have a really nice interior, might have more land. There were actually two houses that were sold both before the project in 2014 and after the project. So one in 2018, one in 2021. And both of those saw much higher sale prices uh, and pretty much tracking what the normal yearly increase was, three to 4% a year. Um, you know, the, the, if you look at the top one, that sold for almost 30% more. Um, so it certainly did not seem to be affected by the solar project. Um, and, you know, we've heard these concerns. I haven't heard any specifics, and we did want to, you know, see what data we can pull and what relevant examples. And that's, you know, pretty close to here, and I thought it would be, be useful to see. Um, as we were saying, you know, th there are actually 15 different requirements for the state permit. The county, this county approval is one of those. So we also have to do a historical study, um, some environmental stuff. Um, the stormwater and erosion and sediment control permitting, that is a requirement as well. We obviously have not done that yet. Uh, but we will meet those requirements um, you know, if we get that or if we get the approval from the county. Um, and I think that was the, all that I had. Um, I'm happy to take any questions now or or after the the public hearing session. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Board members, have any questions? I'm getting ready to open up the public hearing, ma'am. Anybody else want to speak? Scott Webb. My address is 1225 Chester Landing Drive, Chesterville, Virginia. Before I get started, I want to comment that one of the hearings they commented that I'm not from here. I shouldn't be speaking. Shouldn't be speaking. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I spend most of my waking hours in Amelia County. I grew up on a farm, milking a cow at six and sucker in the back at five for my grandfather. Um, Jim and I bought timberland our first few years of our marriage, considerable acreages in this county. We just wish we bought more at the time. It was cheaper then. Um, we pay substantial taxes here. I'm invested in this county. Both sides of my family have been in Mia County for over 100 years plus. We've been involved in many projects to benefit our county. The War Memorial Building, Me Academy, Tom Scott Park, the Water Tower, and lots of jobs. I love this county. I'm proud of it. I would never do anything to hurt this county. Thank you for the opportunity to speak for Amelia Energy Project and for Renewable Energy. Having lived in subdivisions with close neighbors for many years, I do comprehend some of the concerns presented. However, this is an ideal site for solar development. The rain is rough, it's isolated, to the end of a prescriptive right of way. Um, it is, um, after construction, I'll be a quiet, peaceful neighbor you will not see or hear from. You can easily go back into timber production one day. Since 2015, I was involved with the projects in Powhatan. I've studied, researched the history, the science, and the technology of renewable energy. Fortune is a solid, experienced developer. 
I researched them and, and investigated them before any real conversations began. We do our develop due diligence first, <coughs> and we talk later. Dominion Energy speaks well of Torch, as do their competitors. I've talked to many of them. I want to speak for a moment about private property rights. I talked about this before, but I think it needs to be addressed again. The founders of our country who worked on the Constitution had it right. They sought to create a government to protect the rights of Americans to own private property. John Adams, our second president, was the principal author of the oldest written constitution, which is still in use today, verbatim. Private property rights must be secure, or liberty does not exist. Private property rights separate us from communist and totalitarian countries. We are losing our freedoms today from both the left and the right. We're also facing a major energy crisis in the Western world, and our NATO allies are much, off, are much worse off than we are. We have energy resources we're not using. Um, I talked about this before, too, but um, on-road uh, on diesel bulk, 7,500 gallons, was $1.74 in November of 20. This week it was 575, an increase of 328%. And last week prices were higher. Trucks bring everything you need. Sooner or later it comes to you on a truck. Green energy is possible. It's rapidly advancing. More panels per acre, less acreage required, improved battery storage, repowering of panels. But it's not a light switch you can turn on and off. It should be a long-term 50 to 70 year process. I think we're gonna need fossil fuels for a long time. I'm all for a, a planned energy um, program. We need more drilling, we need fracking, we need coal, we need nuclear, and we need renewable resources. We've enjoyed the highest standard of living in the world since the 1770s. Without adequate energy, we will not sustain our standard of living in America. Energy independence equals national security and fiscal stability. In a short time, we've lost our energy independence. Inflation is rising, interest rates are rising, we're not fiscally stable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Do the board members have any comments? All right, I'll open the public hearing. I wish to speak for or against. Ma'am. Can you, man, man, you come to the top, we still got to know who you are. Thank you. Diana Morris, 5740 West Creek Road, District 3. Have you all, do you all have a count of how many private residences and citizens will be affected and are on the surrounding properties? That number? Have you all done a study? The surrounding map that you show, your grid project. My driveway, I'm on West Creek Road, my driveway alone is 2,000 feet and long. So, and where they have already timbered night and day and torn up the roads and came to our line and actually took some of our trees off of our property. So I don't believe that that's accurate. And um, on your Powhatan County um, assessment of the houses, um, I'm not sure who the realtors were that sold that or the private sales or whatever. Um, a lot of times in this desperate market where there are not enough homes for the buyers, um, sometimes um, people do not properly disclose 
which we would be required to do as a licensee to disclose that we all have a solar farm uh, as an adjoining property. Um, and if they didn't do that, then they could have gotten a buyer from out of state or somewhere that, you know, desperate to get in a house and didn't know about the project because it wasn't properly disclosed. So yes, property market values are up now, but the, the as you know, um, I've been in 27 years and the home market does not always stay the same. So when we have a normal market, which we will get back to, you know, these things are not that those reports are very misleading. Thank you, Diane. Um, come up to the microphone, name and address. Folks, if, just make your comments, and the folks over here at Torch will be making well, uh, a list of questions, and they will address them. Patricia Patton, 9720 Priceville Road. I don't have much interest in solar, don't know much about it, wasn't prepared to think about this until I started listening to it. But I would caution people before you start agreeing to this sort of thing that you think closely. I listen to this. My good friend, Diana Morris, you know, her and I have been in. Can you hear me now? Uh, my friend, Diana Morris, is very correct about something. But let me tell you what. I've been in both sides of rezoning something and getting stuff done. I'm now on the homeowner thing. And I will say this. You can have some really eloquent people come up here and talk about it and cherry pick all this stuff they want to because a lot of that stuff could be cherry picked and it may not. Property values are usually going to be determined not by somebody going out and doing a market analysis on what has happened in the last few years, but it's going to be determined by the person that's actually going to be living near this thing. You know, I talked to people about another issue. And this solar thing came up a lot, and they weren't worried about it as long as it wasn't by them. So the true measure of that is, is it going to be near you, and what do you really want to do for the people in the county? I don't have an opinion on it now, but I should. I think we should be very careful to not be fooled by people that cherry-pick opportunities and results that we think that we can make a decision by. And when you say, well, it's 12 miles away, I don't care. But you may very well care. So let people within this county do some looking at property values and and anybody wants to measure the value of property for the last three years it's not even relevant covid changed the way real estate does they had a bidding war like they did in 03 and 04 and now it's going to go back to normal diana's right it will come back to normal again but we won't know what normal is we don't have normal results to gauge it i'll probably come back and talk about this later I don't have enough information now, but I will say, be cautious of cherry picking and location. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak? Just remember, do you want this in your front yard? Thank you, Mr. Hill. Um, again, I listened to this very, very elegant presentation. A lot of numbers. Looks real good for the county. And it looks so good, I'm thinking maybe we need to start digging in dirt here a little bit. You know, we got a lot of magnetic dirt here, which we keep drawing these solar farms in here. So maybe we need to sell magnets and make a little more money off of it. But the thing of it is, this, uh, proposal here talking about uh, land property, okay? I did the analysis of two residents, so looked like it was about a $45,000, $50,000 increase in revenue from the time that the house was bought in 14 and 15 and sold in 21. Well, when the houses are sold in 21, the market value jumped way up. It should have been a $150,000 increase on those houses according to the average market value of year today. And it was only a forty-five dollars or $50,000 on these modern homes. That tells me that it sounds good, but it doesn't have the meat that it's supposed to have or should have. You take it, go somewhere else away from those and sell the same home, 
at the same thing, you would see a way different range in the market value of it. But uh, that's what to compare and, and to. My concern is, if this is all so well and good, how much money they're putting up front, there's something behind this that doesn't look good. But what's going to happen in November? When Congress changes and the Senate changes, and they pull the plug on the Green New Deal. It's all this garbage is going to be sitting over here in our county because all that's going to stop. Then what are you going to do with it? Well, the market changed, they go fold, and they're gone. That's what's going to happen. Because this could be a new direction to go in. And that's something this county needs to look at. Uh, yeah, it's big energy right now. But how many sheep farmers we got up here? How many sheep farmers we got back here? We're going to make a market because we're going to be a sheep farm in county because we can have sheep underneath our solar panels. How much demand is it for sheep? How much demand is it for cattle? How much demand is it for corn, soybean, where you can move the tractor and move through? My question is, what is really going to produce for the best for the land for the county? My name's Justin Wade. I'm parcel 54-2D. And I'm for the project. Like you said, it's not close to anybody's house. I've grown up there for 37 years on Poor House Road. The land has been in my family for since the 1800s. And I've watched it dwindle away every year. And I've never been able to stop it. And with helping this project and land comes available, I'll be able to buy it. I would like to never see another house on that road built if it was up to me, ever. And so, if this is what I need to do it, I'm all for it. Thank you. Anybody else? Hey everyone, Martin Conkle, 16211 Church Street. I've been following this since the beginning at the very first planning commission meeting, every other planning commission meeting. Um, I caught the last one on YouTube. Um, when this first started, I, I caught the torch guys head out the door at the first meeting where the email was read and it wasn't too nice for them. And I told them, if you're gonna come in this county and want this, I gave you fair warning, you're not gonna get this rubber stamp like you thought you might. And I just wanna say first, thank you for everybody for showing up. I love seeing people here. When people show up, we the people win. Because we were involved, because us people stood up and spoke, it did force them back to the drawing board and they had to redo this plan. I would not have supported this the way it was written. It was not a good plan, it was not done right. But I think we've reached maybe a bit of a level of reasonableness on their end. And there is opportunity here for the county. We're a conservative county. We want our tax rates to remain low. This is a way to supplement costs and projects in the future and stuff like that. That is the opportunity that's presented. They have very well, I think, done well by neighboring by the neighbors and stuff thousand feet away from a house is pretty good if you want to see a solar project project done wrong go up to genito road that is how you do one of these projects incorrectly and i don't really think the county got any benefit from that whatsoever the other bomb that most of you people don't know here is we almost did not have this opportunity to sit here and talk about this or approve this the yunkin election was kind of a fluke nobody expected that i'm glad for it I had the Democrats won, and I really wish the person who was inside of all this could have spoke on this himself. The first bill that was going to come across the desk of the state was pretty much going to remove the power of the localities to have any say in these matters. This would go in front of a state board. We'd have no say as people. They would have no say as our local government, and it would be forced down our throat as is, no questions asked. That almost happened, and while I hope the last election is not a fluke, it very well may be. Whether we like it or not, as people of this county, this stuff is coming. 
Right now, we can control it. Right now, we can benefit from it. If we pass this up, we might, got, we might not be so lucky in the future. And I think that is something that we need to take into consideration as we move forward. Thank you. Comments? Right, this time I'll close the public hearing. Board members' comments. <clears throat> Have any questions for Porch? Take that opportunity to clarify that we've talked to Torch for a year now and had opportunity for all of our questions. Like, so the fact that we have none is only because we've spent a year studying this and going through all the details. Yeah. And they've been very helpful. We've also researched it independently too, and not relied everything on what Torch provides. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eason. What's the boy's pleasure? I'll, okay, what I I'll make a motion to postpone it till next month so we can kind of take in what the uh, citizen said. Okay. Let's look at it. Is that in the form of a motion? It was. Yes, it was. There's a motion on the floor to defer for 30 days. Discussion? Favor? I will, I'll speak on that. I, I think we'd be doing our be doing wrong if I didn't look at Robbie's books. I would like to see your book. I would like to see that copy of that book you had, but I don't. Not now, but I don't. I don't think we'd be doing our due diligence if we didn't look at something for that. All right, that brings us to the signing agreement. Yeah, here we go. Um, so the next public hearing that was advertised uh, is for solar siting agreement uh, for the project where the torch project where we just heard the uh, special exception permit. Uh, like the revenue share ordinance we talked about a little while ago that you all adopted uh, that same year in 2020, the General Assembly authorized localities and utility scale solar projects to enter into uh, solar facility siting agreements. Uh, these siting agreements can go above and beyond what's in the zoning ordinance. It can go above and beyond what's in the special exception permit. As far as um, you know, giving the, the county and the company wide latitude to negotiate additional provisions uh, dealing with the project and the facility, including additional source of revenue and a revenue stream. So um, I won't go line by line um, before we have the public hearing, but I'll hit some highlights uh, for, the, for you all, for the public. Um, you already heard about the project. What the siting agreement would do uh, if it were agreed to, um, A, it would tie very uh, neatly to the special exception permit if that were to be approved at some point. Uh, in other words, it would give the county both a zoning authority over the over the project and a contractual authority to enforce provisions. Um, so there's been a lot said about decommissioning. Uh, there would be a bond. That bond requirement is in the special exception permit. It's also in the siting agreement. Um, the siting agreement calls for that bond to be revisited every three years, whereas your ordinance only has a every five year requirement in the county, the county ordinance on these facilities. Uh, the siting agreement goes beyond that and would require the company to pay for uh, engineering analysis every three years to make sure that the 
the, the, the bond was enough to cover the uh, cost of decommissioning. Decommissioning is what happens when the project life is over. Um, whether that's 40 years or 15 years, it doesn't matter uh, when the project is no longer, uh, 50, 40 years is the, is the max. So anytime before that, uh, the, if the project is no longer operational for a period of time, then it would uh, trigger the decommissioning requirements, both in your zoning ordinance and the special exception permit and in the siting agreement, if that were approved. Um, and the, the bond would provide security for the county to cover those costs should the landowner and or the company not not do not do the decommissioning, which returns the, the land back to its prior state. Um, I will fast forward here to the revenue piece of the siting agreement. Again, this is a new new enabling authority under state law that not available to localities just a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, so what the agreement that has been negotiated so far does it, it, it has two types of payments from the applicant to the county. First, there are initial payments, and that's when the project's put online. Um, and, there, and it would be phased, but initially in the first couple of years, it would be just shy of a million dollars in payments to the county uh, when the project's put online, when both phases are online, uh, which would be 24, 25 at, at the outside, 2025 for the second phase. Um, then there would be a stream of annual payments, um, and those are indexed to a 3.5% uh, uh, inflationary adjustment rate. Um, and uh, ultimately, they uh, would produce uh, about a little over $7 million over the life of the project. So when you look at the initial payments plus the annual payments plus the revenue share from the ordinance, um, we're looking at just over $17 million is the county's estimate um, in revenues. Now, st statute and the agreement gives the county wide latitude on how to spend the revenue. Um, it can be spent on broadband, it can be spent on any, any on education, any capital infrastructure that's in your CIP uh, or is in your annual budget. Uh, really, there's there's just wide latitude under the statute and under the agreement on on how to spend the funds if this were to go forward. So that's the revenue piece of it, but it also ties in directly with the permit and your ordinance on decommissioning enforcement, things like that. That's sort of the high level uh, of of what the agreement would do. State law does require a public hearing. What's unique about this is it didn't go through the planning commission because state law does not provide for that. This is this agreement goes you know straight to the board, so this has not been discussed at the planning commission level, um, although it has been you know publicized and available at the county for anyone who wanted to in inspect the draft of it. So that's high level. I can answer answer any questions before or after the hearing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Goal. <clears throat> board members have any questions, Mr. Goal? Hearing none, I open the public hearing on the siting agreement. I wish him to speak. Siting agreement. All right, this time I'll close. The, this time I'll close the public hearing. In my opinion, we ought to defer this for 30 days, too, while we're still considering it. Mm -hmm. Special exemption, is that? I agree. I'll make a motion for that. Okay. Motion on the floor to defer this one for 30 days, too. Any more discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries. All right, that brings us to the county administrators. We need to have a recess. I don't think it would hurt to take a five minute recess and you step to the back. Well, no, Holly, she was just back there. All right. All right. What's going on? All right, Ms. Harvey, bring it to your. Okay, the first item under county administrator's report, tab 16, 
Check from waste management for the month was $263,578.21. Uh, that's pretty uh, in the ballpark from what we've been having for the past uh, year, I guess now. One, one item of note is uh, they shut off prematurely a contract they had for some biosolids because it was ranker than what uh, their system could have. So they, uh, they pull that. Ab 17, Commonwealth Regional Council. That's their monthly report for April. I'd be glad to try to answer any questions that anybody might have on there, or Mr. Jones, possibly. The DMV select report for the uh, month, $4,234.94 collected. Um, the gross compensation accrued so far is $34,061.98. That's for the fiscal year. Commonwealth Gas of Virginia. They have sent a notice for a rate increase. This is their 60-day notice as required by the SEC. The item 20 title doesn't do it justice. This is approval from the Attorney General's office for our redistricting plan. So that's been accepted by the Attorney General's office. Item number 21 is a supplemental appropriation for Roland Meadows. This is uh, a construction project that was done outside of the budget. We had some money in a trust account for, uh, to cover this. So it was switched over so it could be spent or paid out. That I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have for that. Have any questions? All right, before we get into board members' comments, there is a need for a workshop or a continued meeting for a discussion past CIP issue, not issue, capital improvement projects that have, have had no direction on. Uh, what's everybody's schedule look like to have a workshop? Have it at night? Hmm? Have it in the evening? No. Well, I've been in, in, in the evening in the past, but this one may be pretty, Stan says this one could be pretty lengthy. Do it in the afternoon. You asked for availability. I'll just say I'm getting ready to go out of town for uh, about two weeks, so I'm going to need it to be June 6th and later. Okay. About June 8th, that's on Wednesday. We used to do them. Got to work for me. Mr. Harvey, how long do you think this one would take? Is it something we need to start in mid-afternoon? Well, the uh, different projects that are have uh, been subject to the feasibility studies would be the uh, library, Kendall Building. I don't really think there's all that much need to talk about the radio project because that one's uh, well on the way. The Parks and Recreation had a feasibility study Animal Shelter had a feasibility study, and the 360 East Water and Sewer expansion was talked about. I think that uh, you could probably spend an hour and a half on each and still not get where you wanted to be. So that would be four hours too much at a time. Maybe you could catch half of it in four hours. I guess I'm confused. Like, we already decided which of these to proceed with and we just did the, approve the funding for those we were proceeding with. What's the discussion? I think, we, I think we want to bring two members up to speed on the 360 East water. It might not have been in the capital. That, we want to bring them up to speed. Um, 
Why not take four hours? Sounds like we don't have a very there's, clear. There's some funds left over from the Hendel building last year. Same thing with the sports complex. Just, just bring everybody up to speed on what's sitting out there. I mean, we have exist. I mean, the existing practice is when a project finishes, the fund and they underspend, the funds are returned. That should have already been done for both of those. They haven't spent it. But they've closed out both of those phases, right? Thanks. Maybe it would be helpful if like, we're supposed to be getting the updates on the CFP projects every two months, but since 2022 started, we haven't gotten any. Okay. Maybe a helpful start would be give us updates on the projects. We could even spread these out. I mean, if they're, they're long, you know, do yeah. one or two a month over the next few months would be fine too. Okay. I'm not we'll very urgent. For the detailed, you know, for in depth. We'll get an update on the project. We'll have that ready for the workshop. We'll do it about six o'clock, evening, or a couple of hours. See how much progress we make. What's the date? June 8th. All right, now we can move on into the board members' comments. Mr. Jones, I'll pick on him since he's on that end. I don't really have much to say. Wyatt? Um, I've got a couple of things. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all the citizens for all the support, all the phone calls, emails, uh, people greeting me in public. I, I really appreciate it. Um, it's always good to know that, that whether we're doing right or wrong, um, it's always good to hear from people, so at least we know we're doing something. Um, uh, I want to take a second. Uh, everybody don't mind. I'm going to kind of jump off, off of here for a second. Um, I would just like to tell you about my wife real quick. Um, indeed, she has worked for the schools for 15 years, um, and she's dedicated her, her uh, career to our children, which is impressive. But beyond that, um, she's, a, she's a mother of four children, and if you want to include me, that would be five. Um, she's done a good job with all of us. I wouldn't be here today on this stage if it wasn't for her supporting me. And um, she's a two-time cancer survivor over the last seven years. Um, she has aches and pains every day. Uh, she's missing three vertebrae out of her back. Um, most people don't know that because she doesn't complain. We don't talk about it. We're pretty private. Um, we've been very blessed. And, uh, you know, I, I got to say, she's, uh, I've never met anybody with as strong a faith as she she has. Uh, she's a, a role model for anybody and everybody. Definitely for me. And on uh, on Friday, she'll be walking across the stage at Longwood to get her master's degree. And I just want to tell everybody, I can, I can never, I'm not good at showing emotion. I can never tell her enough how proud I am of her. I thank her for everything she does. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, I just got, I just wanted to share a couple of Bible verses with everybody. It's always good to read your Bible. Uh, um, good stuff for us to live by. James 119 and Proverbs 17, 27, and 28. I think we could all learn from those. Uh, congratulations to the class of 22. Uh, my baby girl, my oldest baby girl is graduating. I'm not ready for that either. Um, I'm proud of those kids, and I'm looking forward to their turn um, to, to take these spots and, and run our county for us. Robinson? i got a couple things I'd like to say. First off, I'd like to thank uh, R.J. Smith Companies for the work that they're doing over there for the soccer fields at no charge to the county. Uh, I think that was pretty good. And I got a few little words that I kind of put together. I'd like to say a few things that um it's happened in the last few months that i've become aware of anyhow we all live in amelia county and i believe we all want what's best for amelia we have too many groups that are working against each other some of the very people who are supposed to be helping are simply acting like pot stirrers and instigators 
And we need to work together so the county can prosper. Facebook posts, they're a good example of pot stirring and complaining, but nobody ever offers a solution to any of the problems. I received some emails saying that people that go to Sidner's store go there to buy beer or gas. And I need to be talking to educated people. We're all the same, regardless of race or financial status. We're all the millions. Nobody is any, is any better than anybody else, whether you're educated or not. We all came here the same way, and we're all going to leave the same way. We need to come together as a county. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Um, thanks. I was going to let it pass uh, with no additional comments, but after hearing all that uh, about pot stirring and the irony that uh, while Mr. Wyatt and I have personally been attacked by the board all year, and I know we can each take it, it was a new low last month when his wife was attacked. And I think that continued this month when my family was attacked as well, with uh, board members initiating a complaint against my family's business, which the county thoroughly investigated and found to be completely a farce. And then board members uh, within the past two weeks spreading some uh, pretty bad rumors uh, that involved one of our applicants for um, rezoning. And unfortunately, he is well aware that, that was, none of that was true and, and has uh, been very, expressed his sorrow that we're caught up in all of this. But I just find it really ironic to talk about the, the pot stirring and then to continually be doing it behind our backs, to our faces, and across the county. I do hope it stops as well. That would be great. All that with all, I'm going to congratulate the five of us. We had a good meeting. There was no personal attacks. We all disagreed. <laughs> what a low we, bar. I'm going to consider this a success. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs> you wanted to continue. You said you were going to continue it. But, workshop. but the way you voted early in January was that you, the way you would do workshops was to I continue. We could, I thought we could assign workshops. 